Uh, I'm going to talk about large-scale sculpture and public art through the lens of the work fabricated at Lippincott Incorporated, the company founded by my father, Donald Lippincott, and his business partner, Roxanne Everett, uh, who you see here in the sh office at the shop in North Haven, Connecticut. Fortunately for all of us, Roxanne also created a huge photo archive of over 10,000 images documenting the sculptures they made there. And this vast and incredible archive is the basis of the book, Large Scale, that I wrote about the early years of the company. When they started out in 1966, Don and Roxanne saw a growing interest among artists in exploring large-scale sculpture, in some ways similar to the increase in the scale of the work of the abstract expressionists of the 1950s and 60s. While painters could create ever larger canvases on their own, an increase in scale for sculptors meant exploring industrial fabrication. During the 60s and 70s, the government was more active than ever before in buying and commissioning public art. With the founding of the National Endowment for the Arts in 1965 and the 1% for Art Programs, which dictated that 1% of the budget for any new building would be dedicated to purchasing artwork, an unprecedented amount of funding was available for art in public spaces. The public was a very important part of public art because I think there was a real attempt, a very democratic idea during this time, of making art available to everyone, to bring it out of museums and off of pedestals, into the street and into people's everyday experience. There were also a large number of public shows in the late 60s and early 70s that featured large-scale sculpture. These shows often tied in with attempts at urban renewal at the time and were a way to get people to visit the cities and develop a greater feeling of connection and civic pride. Dovetailing all this activity was the interest for sculptors in citing work outdoors, which was very much related to the increase in the scale of their work. This is an aerial view of the field next to the Lippincott shop. You can see all the sculptures on display there and the shop building is at the back left. It's hard to remember that in the early days of the company, in the mid-1960s, large-scale modern sculpture was not much in evidence. There was little new public art in cities, most museums and galleries did not have adequate space to show larger sculptures, and collectors, public or private, hesitated to commission large-scale projects based on drawings and small models alone. Don, Roxanne, and the artists all felt that the best way for people to appreciate large-scale sculpture was to see it in person, and the field next to the company was used as an open-air exhibition space. This offered prospective buyers a chance to see these sculptures realized and to develop an understanding of their impact and importance. Lippincott always welcomed visitors, and many students, artists, curators, and collectors came to see the work there. Usually several different artist projects would be happening simultaneously, and in a way the shop served as a group studio space, far more elaborate than any one artist could have. This is a view of the shop workspace with several sculptures underway, including Claus Oldenburg's geometric mouse at the front and George Sugarman's trio at the back. Prior to the inception of Lippincott, if sculptors wanted to create works of art larger than their studios or their own metalworking abilities allowed, they had to work with industrial manufacturers such as auto body shops or boat builders. The problem with such working relationships was that those companies were set up to manufacture a specific product in an established fashion not to work with an artist on the more complex and typically non-linear creative process of making art. Concerns about the unknowns of costs and the problems of engineering in creating artwork also discourage many companies from taking on these projects. Lippincott was able to address these challenges and put the tools of industrial fabrication at the disposal of the artists. It was the first and for nearly a decade and a half the only company of its kind. This is Tony Rosenthal's Alamo, which was part of the first show of large-scale sculpture in New York City, a show called Sculpture and Environment that took place in the fall of 1967. That's Rosenthal standing next to the sculpture the day it was installed in Astor Place. This is the only piece which stayed after the show ended, and it's become one of the landmarks of the city. If you lean on it hard enough, it still will spin. This is Barnett Newman's Broken Obelisk, which was installed on the plaza in front of the Seagram Building, a great showplace for art back in the day and had many sculptures presented there over the years. There were ultimately three broken obelisks made. One is at the Museum of Modern Art here in New York, one is at the Rothko Chapel in Houston, Texas, and one is at the University of Washington in Seattle. These are two works by Robert Murray, which were shown in front of the Jewish Museum as sculpture, part of Sculpture and Environment. That's Athabasca on the left at the Jewish Museum and Ridgefield on the right at the Lippincott shop before it went to New York. These are two works by Marisol and the one on the left, Three Figures, was shown near the Plaza Hotel during Sculpture and Environment. The one on the right with Marisol is part of her own private collection. 
To give you some background on the way that Don and Roxanne started working with these artists, when they first began in 1966, they compiled the list of sculptors they were most interested in working with, which they had created by going to a lot of galleries and museums and looking at different artists' work. The first group included Marisol, Clement Meadmore, Robert Morris, Robert Murray, Tony Rosenthal, and James Rosati. Roxanne and Don wanted a group of artists whose work was distinctly different from each other's and who would provide an interesting range in terms of fabrication and exhibition. All of these artists were already working sculptors, and some were painters and printmakers as well. They had worked in carved stone, cast bronze, and wood, and some had fabricated small works in steel as well, so there was quite a range of experience coming into this. They were each interested in the possibilities of scale and in what could be created in an industrial setting. This is James Rosati's Lippincott One. This sculpture is part of the Empire State Collection in Albany, New York. As I mentioned before, urban renewal often played a role in these projects, and the Rockefeller government buildings were built as part of the urban renewal in Albany. I found a great description of public art in a catalog for a Rosati show, which I think sums up the aspirations of much of the work of this time. The curator said, simply put, Rosati's hopes for his public art are that it will be a positive presence in the community, causing people to stop, look, return, and enjoy. People are thereby confronted by something addressed not to their practical needs, but their contemplative life, a poetic object in a prosaic environment. These next few sculptures are all part of the Empire State Collection. This is an untitled work by Forrest Myers. That's him with a model on the left with Don and the finished work on the right in the field at Lippincott. This is Ellsworth Kelly with Yellow Blue, one of his first sculptures at Lippincott in 1968. Kelly was well known for his painting, which he certainly continued, and sculpture now became a great interest as well. The 70s and 80s were an incredibly prolific time for him, and he made nearly 100 sculptures at Lippincott over the next few decades. Like the paintings, the sculpture had explored very precise shapes. The earlier works were painted, and so had the perfect even surface typical of his canvases, but he later explored works where the metal was left unfinished, and these had much more variety to the surface. Here's George Sugarman's trio, which was made in an edition of two. One of these is in Albany, and the other is at the Linden Sculpture Garden in Milwaukee. You see some young art enthusiasts here at Lippincott. This was a field trip for a local kindergarten. That's Ronald Bladen on the left with Eddie Geiza, one of the crew, and his sculpture, Cathedral Evening. Bladen had originally built this sculpture himself out of wood for the show 14 Sculptors, The Industrial Edge in 1969, and then the commission from the Empire State Collection allowed it to be built in steel. Here's an example of how the look of a sculpture changes as you move around it. This is Clement Meadmore's Verge and Peter Versteeg, another member of the crew, and this is also part of the Empire State Collection. Uh, here's a piece of another Meadmore called Awakening, and I wanted to show you these photos so you can see how the sculptures are actually put together. This piece was going to Australia, but even closer to home, many of the sculptures would travel around to different shows, and it was always part of the plan in building them to consider how they would travel. Most of the sculptures were made in elements that could be assembled and taken apart relatively easily so the sculpture could be moved from place to place. This series of photos was part of a packet of instructions for the assembly in Melbourne, since this was the rare case of a sculpture not being installed by the Lippincott crew. For all the sculptures made at Lippincott, there was always what was called a test assembly, where the finished piece was put together so the artist could see it and the crew could make decisions about how to stage the installation at the final site. So here they're moving everything to place in the field, fitting two of the elements together. Here's a close-up of that. You can see the pins, which make the corners and the planes line up correctly. And here's the finished piece installed in Melbourne. Here's another installation at the Seagram Building. This is one of the heads from Easter Island. The World Monuments Fund had brought the head to the United States to display as part of fundraising efforts for restoration and preservation work on the island. This is the original head here, and Lippincott cast the head and made an addition that was sold to benefit the fund. Here are two of the heads in the addition. There were quite a few of these around the field for a few years. That's done with Claus Oldenburg. You can see Oldenburg's geometric mouse in the background and Forrest Meyer's untitled work for Albany. Close Oldenburg's lipstick ascending on caterpillar tracks during the first test assembly at the shop. That's Oldenburg standing at the left. This sculpture was commissioned in secret by a group of students and faculty at Yale and was fabricated, installed, and delivered without the university really knowing what was going on. 
The lipstick was initially placed in Beinecke Plaza and later restored and recited in Morse College. Typically, work on a new sculpture at the shop began with discussions of the construction process to establish the final size of the piece, the engineering issues, and the building materials. Usually, an artist would arrive with a model of some kind, either drawings or a small three-dimensional object. That's George Sugarman on the right with his model for St. Paul's Sculpture Complex. From these models, the artist and crew would create templates for each element of the sculpture. These templates would be an exact tracing of each part of the model, and these were enlarged and adjusted by the artist to make the large-scale version. Here, Sugarman is redrawing one of the templates with some elements of the finished sculpture around him. Artists were always encouraged to be directly involved in the process at every stage to guide the work and make adjustments or changes where necessary. Typically, they would review the progress of a sculpture several times during fabrication. The proximity to New York City allowed artists to make day trips as often as they liked, and some would come for several days at a time while the sculptures were being fabricated. Sugarman is working in the original shop building here, which is a very simple factory space with a dirt floor. During the time that this sculpture was being fabricated, a new shop building was built adjacent to this one, a much bigger space, about 25,000 square feet, with two cranes built into the ceiling and large doors that could be open for light and air, as well as to move the sculptures in and out easily. So here we're in the new building. This is the test assembly of the Sugarman. You can see one of the crew on a ladder for a sense of scale. And here's Sugarman being interviewed underneath the sculpture after it had been installed. You can see the spectacular color of the work here too. Louise Nevelson's working process was the exception to the typical scenario at the shop. She often created work directly at scale rather than starting with a drawing or models. Similar to her work in wood, her metal sculptures consisted of found elements, in this case called from the collection at the shop. She worked with remarkable intensity, directing the welders and assembling her work. Her pieces could be quickly collaged together with small welds and then fully assembled after she left. She would usually work for three or four days at a time and then return a couple of weeks later to revisit the work and make changes or additions. Many artists, as well as many of the crew, had very long working relationships with Lippincott. So an artist could work with the same welders on many projects over time, and this gave them a chance to develop a real understanding of the process and a shared language to discuss it. Here's a great installation shot. This is a show of Clement Meadmore's work at the Max Hutchinson Gallery in Manhattan. That's Hutchinson standing on the gantry crane and Meadmore in the center of the work. The crane and hoist allowed the crew to manipulate the elements of the sculpture during the assembly in this very tight space. Here's probably the most recognizable image of the era. This was Robert Indiana's first love sculpture. Uh, this is part of the collection of the Indianapolis Art Museum. This is during the fabrication. You can see some of the edges are polished and some are still rough. Here's the finished work. That's Indiana in the front row on the left with Roxanne and the crew. Indiana explored many variations in sculpture and painting, working with different sizes and colors. That's Ralph Ogden on the left. He was the founder of the Storm King Art Center and Dorothy Mayhall, who was the director of the museum in the early 1970s. They're at the shop with Don in front of Trio and Broken Obelisk. Ogden had started Storm King in 1960 with Peter Stern. He had collected sculpture privately for some years, but the Storm King collection really began when he purchased 13 works from David Smith in 1967, which are displayed around the main building. Ogden and Mayhall had come to the shop to see the sculptures that were going to the Empire State Collection in Albany and to discuss possible work for Storm King. These next few sculptures are all part of the Storm King collection. This is Isaac Witkin with his sculpture Kumo. This is the installation of an untitled work by David von Schlegel. This also looks like some kind of a happening. The square element is made of aluminum and sits on top of the four poles. There are three of these to the piece, all installed in a row. You can see von Schlegel here adjusting the first one, uh, second in progress, and the poles of the third in the distance. This is the installation of an untitled work by Robert Grosner. This is right next to the von Schlegel at Storm King. The central element of the sculpture is being lifted onto its base by the two cranes. Here's a view of the piece before the side arms are attached. And here's an aerial view of the completed Grosner and von Schlegel. This is Claus Oldenburg's wayside drain pipe, which is sited at the top of the hill near the museum building at Storm King. This is an idea Oldenburg explored in drawings and soft sculpture as well. 
Forrest Myers with Four Corners, the first time the piece was set up in the field at Lippincott prior to going to Storm King. Robert Murray's Kiana. This is one of the sculptures from the mid 70s where you start to see Murray pushing the possibilities of forming metal, working with ever more complex folds and curves. Tal Streeter's Endless Column. That's the sculpture during the installation on the left and the artist Tal Streeter with Dorothy Mayhall on the right. And Louise Nevelson at the dedication of City on the High Mountain, her sculpture at Storm King. This is Nevelson's Sky Covenant, which is a commission from the Temple Israel in Boston. The interiors of the boxes were made individually and the boxes are then bolted together to assemble the completed sculpture. The worker at the lower left is grinding the edges of one of the interior components so they fit together properly. Here's the installation at Temple Israel. You see the boxes and the way they stack up and the finished sculpture. The piece is set out from the facade, which creates a beautiful play of light on the building. Ellsworth Kelly on the right at the shop with Curve 2. This piece was part of Philip Johnson's collection at the Glass House and later given to the Museum of Modern Art. Kelly again, looking at Curve 1. These sculptures were part of his retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art in 1973. He and Don are standing here in two, one of the two massive doors to the shop. These doors allowed a great deal of light into the workspace and sculptures were often set up here for temporary viewing. Uh, two more by Kelly. These are Stile 1 and 2, which were part of his own private collection for many years, though they now have both been promised to museums. These are shown near his studio in upstate New York. Kelly would often make groups of sculptures exploring certain ideas and shapes in much the same way that he made his paintings. Claus Oldenburg's Standing Mitt with Ball from 1973. The photo on the left was taken during the fabrication. You can see the ragged edges of the lead interior of the sculpture. These will be trimmed away as the piece is completed. Oldenburg is speaking with Agnes Gunn to commission this piece, and that's the finished work on the right. Robert Murray's Quinnipiac, which was commissioned by the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. That's Murray second from the right with Don and the crew during the test assembly at the shop. The sculpture was the centerpiece of a show called Artist and Fabricator, which was shown in and around the Fine Arts Center at the UMass campus and focused on the working process of the artists at Lippincott. Back of the Seagram building, this is Jean Dubuffet's Milord La Chamar. Uh, here you see the sculpture being moved off the truck by crane, looking like it's flying into the space and being positioned on the plaza. Uh, as always, a huge crowd is gathered to watch the performance. I'm not sure if it was this installation or another one, but my father told me one time a street musician showed up with steel drums and played music all afternoon where they were working, so it really was quite a show. This is a fountain by David von Schlegel called Voyage of Ulysses. The Lippincott crew set up a huge water tank with a pump outside the shop building, and von Schlegel is testing the angle of the water on the sculpture to see how it moves across the surface. Here's Voyage of Ulysses installed in Philadelphia. As you move around the sculpture, you can see references to the form of ships and sails and waves. This is the start of George Sugarman's Baltimore Federal. That's Sugar Sugarman at the shop with his model on the left and watching the fabrication on the right. These photos, photos really show the interaction of the artist, the model, and the large-scale work and watching it all come into being. Sugarman conceived of the sculpture as a collection of covered and open seating areas, inviting people to enjoy the public space in front of the courthouse. Here's an aerial view of the work. Uh, this seems like a very painterly sculpture. The shapes of color are like brush strokes, a sort of painting in space, which is something that Sugarman explored a great deal in his work. Another sort of painterly sculpture, this is Robert Murray's Taku, which has a bit of the feeling of one of the massive abstract expressionist canvases. This is the largest of the large-scale projects. This is Klaus Oldenburg and Kosha van Bruyggen's back column. This is about halfway through the fabrication process, and eventually the sculpture would stretch across the entire workroom. Here's the back column loaded onto the truck to take it to Chicago. That's Kosha van Bruyggen, Oldenburg's wife and collaborator on the left, with Eddie Geisa and some members of the crew. Uh, the children left to right are me in the pointy hat doing a bit of early research uh, with my brother Jeff and our friend Matt. We were all allowed to skip school to watch the back column go off to Chicago, which was very exciting. 
And I'm going to finish up with two more works by Robert Murray, uh, Saginaw on the left and Hillary on the right. It's interesting to think back of much of the sculpture of the mid-60s, which tended to be minimal, solid, and geometric, and then to look at the visual lightness of these forms. They have the feeling of volumes in motion. You can see there's a real exploration happening in the possibilities of industrial fabrication. The equipment at the Lippincott shop was standard issue for fabrication shops, but the experimentation with these machines, led by Murray and some of the other artists, resulted in a remarkable range of non-geometric forms. It wasn't the newness of the technology that made the sculptures fabricated at Lippincott so remarkable, but the new and creative ideas from the artists about how to put it to work. So I'm going to stop there, and I'll be happy to, happy to answer any questions. And if there's books around, I'll sign those afterwards. Thanks very much. Uh, no, pretty much, excuse me, pretty much exclusively in metal. The Easter Island heads were their only sort of foray into concrete uh, and really the only casting they did. It was a cold metal shop. But if artists were interested in other materials uh, or needed elements, the Marisol I showed earlier, the faces of those were cast elsewhere. And Oldenburg's mitt with ball, the ball was made out of wood uh, by a woodworker. So for the most part, they just did metal, but they would subcontract out other pieces if they needed them. Uh, no, I don't think so. They were just on the building side of things. Yeah. I'm not always sure the artists reap many of the rewards yeah, by the time true. it was all over. But... I'm not gonna so well, but... Yeah, well, it was interesting looking back sort of how things evolve over time, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Yes. Right, most of the, f the forming was done with a brake press and with a roller, and oftentimes, um, actually let me just go back one slide because these are kind of a perfect example. Uh, the forming was all done with the brake press and the roller, but oftentimes what you see here looking like one curve would actually be made in several pieces. So a piece of metal could be taken apart and made into the curves and then reassembled. So it was sort of a combination of forming and assembling um, to create the more elaborate curves. Um, with Meadmore's work as well, there was sort of a combination of those two things. It was different ways of using the machinery and of combining elements to make those things happen. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't ever work with Lippincott. I believe he actually did do most of his work himself, but I'm not, I'm not totally sure. That's sort of another kind of forming. I think he was also using the press. Um, and other kinds of sort of compression uh, machinery. So. Have, were there engineers that were oh, yes. like doing the calculations and then the layer of the sort of fabrication? Yes, there was an engineer, uh, Robert Jennings, who worked with a company, who continues to work with the company now, but who worked with them right from the beginning. And that was also a piece of uh, certainly some of the larger sculptures um, that was always a part of the, of the uh, process that they were at. I'm really, I'm not sure, I don't think this is on. Monty, <laughs> but I won't. I have a loud enough voice. Thank you very much, Monty, for being here. Sure. Um, Thank you. Well, then, um